My name is Anne Renault, and I write children's books. Today, I'd like to talk to you about my book entitled Fania's Heart, which is a Holocaust story. This book was illustrated by a talented Nova Scotia artist named Richard Rudnicki and was published by Second Story Press. Now, the Holocaust may not seem like an obvious choice of topic for a book for young readers, in this case, for nine to 12 year olds. But I believe that you can write about almost any topic for children. It's all in the way you present the material. And while there may already be hundreds of books written for children on the Holocaust, I also believe there can never be too many. We need to record every Holocaust story because every story is important and needs to be preserved and heard. So when I heard about the heart of Auschwitz, I knew that this was a Holocaust story that I wanted to bring to young readers. I first became aware of the heart of Auschwitz 10 years ago when I saw a documentary by Montreal filmmaker Carl Leblanc. I strongly encourage you to view this documentary if you haven't already. You might be able to borrow the DVD from a library or you can order it online. This film told the story of Fania Landau, a Polish Jew who had been sent to Auschwitz in 1944. When Auschwitz was evacuated in January 1945, Fania left the camp with one possession, a heart-shaped birthday card given to her for her 20th birthday. The card had been made under horrific conditions and against all odds by her fellow prisoners who worked with her at a munitions factory outside of Auschwitz. These women, along with Fania, were among the thousands of slave laborers who were forced to make weapons for the Nazis. The documentary also told the story of how the filmmaker had tried to find the women who had made and signed the card. And what piqued my interest even more was that this heart, which is one of the very few known objects that have been made by prisoners of, in Auschwitz, was in my home city and on display at the Montreal Holocaust Museum. It was Carl Leblanc's film that compelled me to see the heart for myself. Although I had seen it on film, what struck me when I first saw the real heart was its size. It is tiny, slightly bigger than a toonie. And of course it's tiny because it had to remain a secret. Had it been discovered by the Nazis, the women who made it would have been beaten or killed. What this heart represents is enormous. The card is all at once an act of defiance, an expression of hope and love for a fellow inmate, and a testament of the women's strength and their capacity to rise above adversity, even in the darkest of places. The heart's pages unfold like an origami flower. 19 birthday messages are inscribed inside, 15 in Polish, one in German, two in French, and one in Hebrew. What prompted the women to make the heart for Fania, other than their friendship, was a simple comment she made. After being imprisoned in Auschwitz for almost a year, Fania had one day made the comment to her fellow inmates that she would soon be an old lady because her 20th birthday was coming up. And the reason she said she would be an old lady is because in her group of workers, Fania was one of the oldest. Most of the other women were still teenagers. And it was this comment that gave her fellow inmates the idea to make a birthday card for her. I think it's also important to stress that having lost everything in the war, the heart is Fania's only material link to her past. This is a photo of Fania taken in 2010 at the Montreal Holocaust Museum, looking at her heart. So having seen the heart for myself 
and having decided that this was the story I wanted to share with young readers, I then set out to speak with Fania. I contacted the filmmaker, Carla Blanc, and he put me in touch with Fania's daughter, Sandy Fainer, who, lucky for me, supported the project and who very graciously agreed to share her family history with me. Sandy acted as my go-between. I would ask her questions to ask her mother. She would ask her mother the questions, then email the answers back to me. This process worked for me. Because of the nature of the questions I was asking, I didn't want this to be a burden to Fania. So I felt more comfortable having Sandy as my conduit, and Sandy preferred it this way as well. Because the book is intended for a young audience, it was a challenge for me to gauge just how much or how little information to include in this book. Also, because I am not Jewish, I felt that perhaps I was not the best person to tell this story. But what I realized is that at its core, this story is about hope and courage, and those are universal themes. And so as long as I told Fania's story as respectfully and authentically as I could, this is what mattered. This is what the real Sandy and Fania looked like in the 1950s, around the time that Sandy found the heart in her mother's belongings and brought it to her to ask what it was and where it came from. And this is how they are depicted in the book. Sandy and her mother live in Toronto. And during the four years that I researched and wrote the story, Sandy and I never met in person. We developed a telephone and email relationship and I only met her face to face at the launch of the book in March, 2018. As I mentioned, the illustrations in Fania's Heart are by Richard Rodnicki, an award-winning Nova Scotia artist. And I think Richard was very good at conveying the oppressiveness, the sense of hopelessness and helplessness of Auschwitz. The women all seem to blend into one. His rows of prisoners in stripes with similar faces and skin which match the backgrounds evoke dehumanization and even imply disappearance. I would like to read a few passages of the book to you now. We sat at long tables, 10 of us on each side. We were forbidden to talk, forbidden to move from our benches. We worked for 12 hours, elbow to elbow. Lunch was usually soup made from nettles and weeds. Because we were so hungry, we ate whatever was given to us. We had to eat if we wanted to survive. To keep from gagging, I would close my eyes and imagine my mother's chicken soup. At dusk, we lined up outside the factory to be searched. The guards wanted to be sure we were not smuggling anything to use against them. Exhausted, We then set off on the hour-long march back to camp. When it rained or snowed, our wooden shoes sank deep into mud or slid on patches of ice. The guards were quick to whip or kick us if we stumbled and fell. Evening meant soup again, this time flavored with potato or turnip peel. We also received our daily ration of bread often stale or streaked green with mold. At night, we crowded into three tiered bunks made of planks of wood. We slept four, five, and even six to a bunk on a thin lice infested mattress with no pillow and one blanket to cover all of us. I dreamed of my family, my older brother Libo, my younger sister Mushka, and my dear mother and father. I prayed I would see them again. Every day I searched for their faces among the other prisoners, but I never found them. I miss them so, I still do. This next excerpt describes the day Fanny received the heart and how the women she worked with had made it for her. I did not imagine feeling any differently on my birthday than I had on all the days before. 
but I was wrong. On the morning of December 12th, I sat at my workbench and noticed something being handed from one coworker to the next and slowly making its way to me. It was a small birthday cake my friends had pieced together from their precious bread rations. They had remembered. Tucked inside the bread was the heart you hold in your hands. At first, I did not know what it was. I quickly hid it in my armpit so it would not attract the attention of the guards. Luckily, they did not find it when they searched us at the end of the day. Now, in case you are wondering what happened to Fania after she received her birthday card and how it eventually made its way to the Montreal Holocaust Museum, I do provide some background information at the end of the book. When Auschwitz was evacuated in January 1945, the birthday card traveled with Fania, tucked in her armpit, as she trudged roads and rode cattle cars westward to Ravensbrück, the women's concentration camp in Germany. After the war, Fania made her way to Canada aboard the ocean liner Aquitania. Following her arrival at Pier 21, in Halifax Harbor on April 29, 1949, Fania settled in Toronto, after which her birthday card took up residence in her bedroom dresser. In 1988, Krisha Starker, the director of the Montreal Holocaust Museum and an old family friend, convinced Fania to donate the birthday card to the museum. Although it's one of the smallest pieces in the museum's collection, its message and impact are considerable. Soon after liberation, Fania met and married Aaron Fainer, the love of her life, with whom she had two children and shared 60 wonderful years. Her daughter Sandy, her son Harvey, her grandchildren and great-grandchildren are her ultimate triumph. And today, Fania Fainer Landau still lives in Toronto. She celebrated her 97th birthday on December 12th. So if you would like to read Fania's heart in its entirety, I encourage you to borrow it from your library or order it from your favorite bookseller or from the Second Story Press website at www.secondstorypress.ca. And if you want to see the heart of Auschwitz up close, I encourage you to visit the Montreal Holocaust Museum, or you can visit this link. I also invite you to visit the Montreal Holocaust Museum's website, where you will find additional information on the heart of Auschwitz, including instructions on how you can make a heart of your own. And I also encourage you to tell me what you thought of the book. You can find my coordinates on my website at annreno.net. So I thank you for listening to my presentation, and I hope to share information on my other books with you very soon.